Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is John Goliatino. Uh, uh, I'm your host today of uh, Danbury Dems. Um, with me today uh, in my home office and at his office uh, is Ken Gucker. He's the state representative for the 138th district. And um, uh, without further ado, let's bring him on. Uh, we're going to um, ask you, first of all, for people that are new uh, in the area that uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself as the up to the point of uh, when you got elected to your office, the things you did before, uh, educational background, or whatever you want to tell us about that uh, somebody new that doesn't know know you. Uh, go ahead. Well, I'm basically a life a lifelong resident of the Danbury area. I grew up in New Fairfield. I attended all of the New Fairfield schools, the high schools, the middle schools. Uh, still have family that reside there. And 28 years ago, I moved uh, to Danbury uh, to my present location. I moved the whole uh, two and a half miles from my hometown in New Fairfield to the northern end of Danbury. Uh, but through my activism of being here in Danbury and realizing that um, we need more people to come together and really fight for our community, fight for environmental issues, fight for uh, responsible development uh, and support for our schools, I became kind of a community activist. Uh, preserving lots of open space, preserving a lot of uh, areas that were not thought about before, and was asked to run for office. Um, I ran for state senate. I came extremely close uh, to winning that seat and then was asked to run for state representative uh, to where we flipped that seat 14 points to be the first Democrat, and I believe 36 years to, to hold that seat. Um, and that's where I've been for the last year and a half. Uh, I was working uh, representing uh, the residents of the uh, western end of Danbury, the southwestern end of the Fairfield, the Wall Pond area, and the northwestern end of Richfield, basically uh, exit one, exit two off of 84. If you're like, if you're in New Jersey, they would say, what exit do you live on? That's how I kind of say Richfield, anywhere from exit one and two to uh, George Washington Highway. Yeah, very good. Uh, now, you gave a, a report on last year, so we won't repeat that so much, but uh, uh, maybe between uh, the tail end of last year and uh, going through um, uh, the virus, what, what's, uh, what's been uh, going on? You know, uh, any, uh, any, anything of uh, great interest, do you think, to uh, voters out there uh, that happened during this period from January uh, through the virus period, as I call it, uh, to, to currently, because you got new things coming up and we're going to get into uh, some stuff that might be happening in the special session also. Well, what happened was we, we in Connecticut and uh, Danbury were actually the first case of COVID-19. Uh, and I remember uh, we were up in Hartford in a, in a session uh, to where we got the, the Danbury delegation and myself got the notification that the governor uh, and, and everybody was coming down to, to Danbury to City Hall to make this sad announcement that the very first uh, case of COVID-19 was now in the city of Danbury in Danbury Hospital. Now, it didn't, it didn't arrive in Danbury. Uh, it was more, I believe, a Richfield resident, uh, which still would be my constituent as well. Uh, but once that happened, we weren't sure where this new world was going. You know, I, I serve on uh, three committees. I serve on banking, I serve on environment, and I serve on planning and development. And we were in the process of getting some good legislation uh, ready to go for this coming season. And sadly, everything came to a screeching halt. Um, the, the government, the, the, the capital was basically shut down. We were told to go home for a couple of days. Uh, they're going to clean the Capitol, come back uh, after the weekend, we'll be good. That was in March. Um, the first time ever I brought uh, lunch in for leftovers, left it in my refrigerator, realized it on the way home, and said, geez, well, I'll pick it back up on Monday. Well, no, that was, Monday was a few months ago. And, you know, and so we didn't open that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you didn't open that bag up. <laughs> that was no. the garbage. <laughs> no. You know, but it's been um, what if anything that this virus has pointed out, it shows how when uh, when there's an emergency, how well 
our legislators and our leadership have dealt with this. I mean, looking at the COVID numbers right now and listening to NPR yesterday, Connecticut is one of two states, Rhode Island and Connecticut, are both in excellent shape as far as our COVID numbers. And it was, you know, sadly having to take these extraordinary steps of, you know, quarantining and, you know, having people stay home and sequester at home and shutting things down. You know, and this and this virus does not discriminate between color. You know, it doesn't discriminate between sexual orientation. Uh, it is a little discriminatory on age because sadly our, our most elder generation is who gets hit with this the most. And we're finding that even though um, the younger generation feels they're invincible, which of course we all felt invincible uh, back in those years, they're bringing it home uh, to their family. So it's very important that we, we stick to the state of the course, we work together and look at the greater good uh, and how positive our results have been. And you know, don't open things up too soon. I mean, I, I would love to get back to work. I mean, we've, from what I understand, we've been busier being my first term, a uh, busier in the short session than they have ever been in the legislature in any session. Uh, the second thing that is shown is this idea that has been perpetuated for many years that we need to keep cutting and cutting and cutting uh, our overhead, so to speak. Being a small business owner, I understand overhead um, in order to get our numbers on the bottom different, uh, better. But what we're finding out is things like our unemployment system that was never designed to take on as much uh, as many people as it had to this time was still from the 1980s. They're still running a uh, cobalt plant, uh, a plan of running. You know, they had to bring in people that retired in the in the 80s to come and run these programs. You know, so it's created a huge backlog with unemployment claims to where every single day I must deal with five or ten claims uh, from individuals that are having issues getting their, their unemployment. Uh, right down to small businesses reaching out to us every day and saying what can we or can we not do we want to do this properly we want to make sure we keep everybody safe and so we've been more rather than making new legislation to create new laws or new uh, funding measures for uh, our constituents it's been more over about how do we keep people safe how we do more constituent services to ensure that everybody has the same information, accurate information, and things that will help them get through this crisis. Because kind of like any other, uh, any other thing that we've had in this country where we've had to make great sacrifice, this is not unlike those situations. How are things, uh, I understand that the COVID-19 has been uh, pretty active among the 50 to 59, aside from the nursing homes and uh how how have our nursing homes fared as opposed to other states like new york and new jersey uh, i didn't hear as much about that as opposed to yeah it hit our older people uh but a lot a lot of people don't know that there's been a lot of 50 to 59 uh that have been hit also i guess the people were going back and forth to new york uh were the ones that got hit so uh any any comments on on those scores? My my specific thing I'm interested in is, is the nursing homes and how they how we did compared to the other states nearest. Well, I will say here in Danbury, our nursing homes like Velosa and, and and others over on the uh, west side uh, fared very well. They they took care of the residents. Um, they were very proactive with keeping uh, the proper PPE and other things available to the workers. Uh, it wasn't so good in some other states or some other areas of the state. Uh, about uh, a month and a half ago, the legislators, uh, myself and others, participated in a caravan. Uh, we had three caravans, one that started here in Danbury, one that started in Norwalk, Connecticut, one that started in New London, and we all converged in Windsor, Connecticut. So we stopped, our, our caravan stopped at about seven or eight uh, different nursing homes to bring attention uh, to people and to the state that these nursing homes needed more support. Uh, some of these for-profit nursing homes, uh, even though they were getting the money for proper PPE, which is personal uh, you know, protective equipment, you know, face masks, uh, gowns, gloves, things of those sorts, 
they were not getting them, even though some of these places had gotten the funding. And like I said, Danbury is an exception to that. But the you know, the uh, individuals that uh, and some of these other bad actors, what it ultimately happens is that these you know these workers are getting sick. You know, some of them were reduced to wearing garbage bags with duct tape uh, to be able to protect themselves. And it's a twofold thing. You know, if a, if a worker is working in a nursing home and their clientele is ill or they have a COVID wing that is that this virus is, is present in, because of their lack of equipment, they could bring that home to their family, which then starts to spread all over. Or vice versa, they could be coming from a family and not knowingly carrying the virus into these nursing homes and without having the proper equipment to protect the residents. We've had those instances. I mean, I know the workers, uh, 11, see 11 or 12 workers at this point, you know, have died due to not having the proper PPE. Now, after that rally, uh, a lot more attention came about. Uh, things are moving in the right direction as far as going after these bad actors, because those are the, uh, the, the age generation where uh, we are having and seeing the highest amount of fatalities sad when we can prevent something from happening we put it in place but yet you know somehow bad actors then convert it into something that works for themselves now what uh you you, you mentioned your committees did you do any committee work during this period because it can be done on camera even though it's it's got to be done delicately you know you can you can all be talking at the same time you can't hear yourselves think uh, so you got to do it one at a time, and sometimes that's not as uh, not as practical as having a committee meeting room. You know, uh, go ahead. The only uh, all of our committee work was was going on before the shutdown in March. I mean, we we got about thirty days in. Uh, the banking committee that I serve on was working on having their first meeting, and then COVID came in, and we did nothing in banking um environmental committee we had already had a number of public hearings we had had a number of committee things we actually got uh some bills voted out of committee out of public hearing that if they choose to take them up in a special session which at this point i'm not holding much hope on that uh they could do that you know as as this virus was growing uh leadership was directing us to say get your stuff through your public hearings, get your stuff off of your desk and get it out there so that if we do have the ability, because they didn't know back in March how this was going to happen, how all this was going to go, how much time we were going to have. So the idea of having a number of good ideas and bills that have been vetted, that have been gone, have gone through committee, that have gone through um, the screening, uh, sitting in the wings ready to go if we needed them. Uh, to do it because you know we're also limited by statutes on when we can and cannot uh, get bills through or get uh, things uh, going. Um, now what we've been having at least once a week uh, as normal as the uh, Democratic House caucus, you know all uh, 79 members of us uh, get on conference calls and talk with you know the um, commissioners of various areas. We've talked to Commissioner's Motor Vehicle was last week, you know, before that Department of Labor, uh, talking with Denise Merrill and, and Kevin Limbo uh, with, you know, controller issues and, you know, and of course with Denise with, with voting issues. You know, and then we open it up to uh, discussing where leadership thinks we are all going to go with this because at this particular time, we really need to focus and concentrate on what is going to best help the state of Connecticut. You know, a lot of those bills and issues that we really wanted to do, they're kind of off the table. We really can't get them because it, it will burn up, you know, time on dealing with the real important things, you know, like dealing with voting, like dealing with budgets, like dealing with school funding, things of those sorts. So that so we're kind of in a holding pattern and every week, uh, you know, the, the calendar gets changed a little bit, but we do uh, hope to to get some good stuff done before we're out. I mean, technically we are out, our session ended, but we're, we're still back. Yeah. Um, what, what were the committees you said, um, uh, banking, environment, and what, what was the other one? 
planning uh, planning committee. Planning, okay. Uh, planning, we I think I believe we had a couple committee meetings, but no real public hearings had started yet. Planning committee is a is a rather large committee. Yeah, uh, I was going to say it was sort of small. like it's sort of like nebulous because planning could be a number of different things unless you limit it yourself mm -hmm. some some areas, you know. Exactly. Uh, so is there anything cooking and planning? Uh, you, you, you probably are you you're looking at the roads and or is that another committee? The roads and the uh, uh, the railroad and <laughs> well, all all of that would be actually in the transportation committee. <laughs> uh, but if you want to talk about roads, one of the projects that I've been heavily involved with, uh, which uh, many people who live uh, in New Fairfield and on the northern end of Danbury who have to travel Route 37. Uh, have been dealing with for over a year now is the Stacy Road uh, intersection with Route 37. Um, you know, sadly, the project had started. Uh, it was going along at a good pace. Uh, unfortunately, the developer who was involved in that committee or in that project was also the same uh, the same developer who was working at Bradley Airport and accidentally caused the massive blackout that happened there, which after the lawsuits and other things happened, put them out of business and bankrupt them to where it stopped, you know, our project here in Danbury on Stacy Road. Uh, that project went dormant for about six, eight months because uh, we had to wait for the bonding company that would be you know, was bonding this job to release the money to then hire a new developer to come in and finish the job. And that dealing with a bonding company and dealing with who they're choosing uh, has been quite difficult. Uh, but with that aspect, um, being that my background is in you know construction and, and designing and engineering of, of buildings and roadways and things, uh, reviewing the plans uh, for that project, which I have a copy of them here in my, my home office, uh, I noticed, you know, thinking ahead that the, the residents of Johnson Drive have been asking the city of Danbury now for five, six years for a sewer hookup. Uh, because their septic systems are failing and they are not able to affordably put and replace and repair those systems uh, to where I was able to go to the state of Connecticut and say, you know, due to all the inconveniences that these people have been dealing with and due to the fact that you're ripping up the entire road, would it make sense, even though it's not approved by the, st the, the city yet, that we get a, uh, a snubbed in hookup off of the sewer line into the right of way area? So that if and when the city of Danbury decides or allows uh, to, you know, to get, um, you know, to allow them to hook up, that it's already there. We don't rip up, you know, the road, you know, and uh, and, and, and undo what we've been waiting to be done for the last two years. And I'm proud to announce that we did get that agreement. It is going in. Uh, so it's some of that, you know, that thinking forward. Uh, the other thing with, um, you know, uh, dealing with uh, transportation, you know, is the tolls issue. You know, tolls right now is not going anywhere. Uh, tolls right now have been, sadly, uh, the governor, I think, you know, even though he's a close personal friend of mine, I think they kind of missed the ball on that. Uh, they kept changing the plan every 10 minutes. So we weren't sure what we were getting. I mean, originally it was truck tolls, then it was going to be everybody, then it was going to be back to truck tolls. Then it was just going to be bridges. Then it was going to be out of state vehicles going over bridges, you know, and with all of that confusion and not knowing exactly what we're getting, it just fed information. Into the there's, there seemed to be some interest in, yeah, let's, those trucks are breaking up the road and, and mm -hmm. doing the truck thing. But then there's general talk, even in, in the, 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 the general citizenry, you know, as you go around and talk to people, at different organizations or whatever, or or talk to them this way, I should say, uh, that uh, they, um, you know, unless it's just to throw uh, just uh, trucks, you know, you got that constitutional thing or the law, you can't really tax uh, that group only. Uh, then they then they're not in favor because now you're you're impeding the the tr back and forth from the the mall to the the, uh, the people in New York and they're affecting too many other people uh, with the general traffic. What, 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 I, 
Well, yeah. what I will say is, and you know, part of what people have been, you know, the, the haters, I call them, you know, the governor said something during his state of the state address um, last year, because we didn't get one this year because due to you know all that's been going on, because uh, we really didn't have a formalized end of session you know, thing. It was the end of session was four people in the chamber with masks, you know, you know, five, 10 feet away from each other. And none of us were there for it. Um, but what with all of the, the stuff that has been done in the state of Connecticut, the governor said one thing in the speech that really resonated. And I actually had bumper stickers made up and started giving them out. It said, stop bad mouthing Connecticut. You know, we all have pride in this state. We all love this state. That's why we're still here. But constantly there are individuals that just want to bad mouth and point out negative instead of like working together and figure out how we can make things better. Now, that being said, there's, they, they constantly talk about, well, how financially uh, bad we are uh, in this position. Connecticut is number seven out of 50 states right now that come out of the COVID-19 virus situation in great shape. We are being recognized throughout the entire country as far as how smart we were with this whole thing. The thing was, it was, it was not fun to go through it, but due to the preventative measures that were done, due to the holding back on the bonding and other things and the borrowing that the governor did uh, last year and beginning this year, our bond ratings are, are great. Um, you know, when it comes down to transportation, uh, they sold out over $800 million worth of bonds in less than an hour on Wall Street. You know, you know I, hear, I hear people go, well, you know, then who pays back the bonds? Well, sadly, that's where the tolls would have come in. Now, I'm not in favor of the tolls, but I understand, you know, the, the reason why they would want them. Uh, you know, with the tolling situation, they originally were talking about a 60-40 split, uh, where 60% of it would have came from residents of Connecticut, 40% would have came from uh, out of state. Uh, then now we're bonding it. We're on the hook 100 percent. But that's what the that's what the people wanted. So that's what we get. You know, part of being the, the word state representative is representing your constituency. And my constituency is three to one against the idea of tolls. Even though if you were to sit down with a with a spreadsheet and look at the financial numbers, uh, you would definitely see why there would be a need to do some sort of plan dealing with transportation and costs. So, so the tolls are more of a longer run uh, thing. If, if not currently they're dead, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a fair assessment? You know, there's so not, a, there's not enough, there's not enough support for it right now. The other thing is what people fear the most is they're not sure, you know, if plan X, say is just trucks would it stay just trucks or would they expand it later on down the road it's kind of like letting the horse out of the barn once the horse is out of the barn you can't say which field it's going to stay in even though you you know you may have fences up and may jump the fence and that's part of the, the concerns that goes on with, with the tolling issue uh, from residents it's even though if we allow this to happen if we go forward with this will it actually stay that way uh, in the future you know we can say yes, but then again, it also relies on who else, who's in power, who's doing, uh, who, who is actually making the numbers at that time. So I don't have a crystal ball. That would be the agreement. That's what I would hope would be the agreement and what they would stay with. But again, you know, I understand people's concerns. Now, an issue that might tie to that in the future uh, is that if the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, has done uh, serious damage to our our budget or not compared to the other states like in New York and New Jersey has done tremendous damage uh, I'm, I'm thinking the way we've managed ourselves maybe not so much damage what do you have to say about uh, that general uh, well you're well you're absolutely right and that's why I was stating earlier that we're number seven out of 50 I mean Kevin Limbo was projecting that we were going to be about I believe six hundred and forty-seven million dollar deficit in our budget. Now, any budget with a deficit isn't that hard to fix, especially with the amount of income that the state of Connecticut gets. But we have three point three billion in a rainy day fund. You know, and thank God we didn't go along with the. I hate to be partisan on this because I don't like to go us against them, but we didn't go with the Republican plan, which was to take half of the rainy day money, put it into transportation. And then bond the rest of us because we would be in serious trouble right now. We wouldn't have, 
you know, that that money sitting there in the rainy day fund. So given that, you know, we can turn around and if necessary, uh, borrow from the rainy day fund uh, that will help us, you know, and, it's, and having that amount of rainy day money sitting there. Uh, is what has given us those great bond ratings to be able to get a reasonable uh, low interest rate on bonds and sell out bonds for transportation. And this is the time to do it because the bonds, it's like it's like wild. The interest rates are low on, on the bonds because of fear that maybe economic activity isn't going to be what it was getting to be for a while. So the it's a good time to actually borrow money if you need to borrow it. Absolutely. Uh, on the other hand, you could take the 347 or whatever, uh, the 647 rather. You could take that, pay it off out of the rainy day fund and, and slowly return the money back in, in there and, and not have uh, much of a hit. And as we hope that as things open up and as businesses open up, that some of our revenue will come back in to help with those areas, you know. Um, so we want to open the state as soon as possible again, but we also want to ensure that everybody is safe. And if it's going to take a little bit longer to ensure that everybody's in a safe position, I'm all for that. All right. Now you're going to have a special session, but we're going to talk about that at another point in time because we got about a, a minute left. And I want you to uh, say your uh, contact information of people on all of the above things that we talked about. If they have things they want to ask you about. Uh, your email, uh, your website, if you have a website or a telephone number, uh, whatever you want to give out so people can contact you. The best way to, to contact me is actually through uh, email, and that's gucker. I'm sorry, that's Ken Kenneth. Dot uh, at at cga. Uh, gov. In fact, I got that wrong. <laughs> it's Kenneth. Gucker at uh, cga.ct.gov okay and then uh is there a telephone number that if they uh have email uh paralysis or whatever <laughs> well they can call my personal number which everybody has which is 203-733-4400 okay. uh nobody would be really up in hartford to answer the hartford number but yeah, the email is the best way to go because i see that every morning yeah and then you can answer with the email yes yes all right well thank you for coming on the show uh, i want to thank the viewers for tuning in uh, uh to uh danbury dems we'll see you next week same time same station mm -hmm.